I would make it this far. They hated, they never believe me. Yeah, I would never drop the ball. I know I make it look easy. Yeah, Mayweather with the defense. I don't care what a critic got to say. I got him picking up the pieces. Got me, you really playing with your life. I'm about to come and run it all back. I'm the new ever about to snap back. You ain't fitting for it because you all cap like. Hold up. I shoot my shot. Wait, hold up. I'm really about to run this. Go up. You know it's all net when it go up. What is up? What's up, guys? It's Race from Off the Grid, as always, with me, my best bud, Christian Marsh. What's up, fam? AKA C Money. And with us tonight, we have one of my actually favorite race directors. Um, he's probably one of the hardest guys I've ever had to deal with off the track. Amateur go kart racer himself, too. Professional eye racer. Big time amateur. <laughs> Alec Coates, everybody. Welcome to the show, Alec. What's up, I'm Alex? Alex? I'm fucking. Wrong I'm trying to figure out the sound effect board, dude. I'm glad to be on, even though I was like Christian's 15th pick and the first 14 canceled, but uh, here we are. We literally just did an episode with Kurt Class's own David Sarah, mm-hmm. and Race was like, "Who do you think's up at 11 o'clock without a life?" And I was like, "Alec fucking Coates, dude. Let me hit this guy up." Yeah, that's fair. I mean, I'm going to catch a little backlash from the girlfriend, but other than that, really not much going on. So Dude, All you're she's got to know some practice on iRacing. If you're in the sim already. That's yeah. true. Yeah. Yeah. In, in all honesty, how often do you iRace? And give me an honest answer. Like not some, you know, oh, I practice all the time. Like how much are you in the seat? No, I mean, I was actually, when I first got into it, I was doing it a lot, but honestly, I'm once a week, maybe now. I'm in here and I'll just do a league race night or I'll run some officials, but, uh, I, I was doing it a lot, but it's kind of fizzled out a little bit. And obviously summertime kind of hurts that I'd rather go play golf and stuff like that. I get that. Dude. I get outdoors, that. What's your favorite golf course? Yep. What's, what's your favorite, up? what's your favorite golf course, dude? We don't talk about anything other than go-karts. Let's talk about whacking balls. Dude. Mm. Northwest Indiana, Indiana as a whole, just not it for golf. So, uh, I mean, <laughs> we got nothing that great around here. So I just go out and find different places all the time. That really, uh, I mean, it's literally how many beers you can drink in eighteen holes is really what it comes down to. It may not be it for golf, but it used to be it for racing, dude. You're pretty close to Michiana Raceway <laughs> Park, aka. That used to be one of the most gangster tracks in this part of the country for sure, dude. I mean, as far as like, yeah, I mean, as far as on track stuff, it, it's a great facility, but obviously club stuff's kind of fizzled down since then, but it happens, happens everywhere. Is that where you grew up racing? Yeah. I mean, I was there since I was probably two years old with my dad. Uh, and then obviously I was in the cart for seven years or whatever, but yeah, I mean, I was out there mostly every Sunday for all my summers, so. That's actually, I I always forget that the DC of the AC-DC, you know, marshalling combo actually raced, like, as a a youngster. Like, David David Coates been at this a long while, right? Oh, yeah. He's always been a major uh, hack, dude, just showing up (laughs) and... uh... Showing up and running whatever uh, whatever he showed up on his open trailer. But, um, yeah, no, he's always been at the car track. Uh, did some South Bend Airport Grand Prix, which were pretty sweet to go to. Um, there's actually used to be a Portage Grand Prix in my hometown, which uh, he always took us to. So, yeah, we were always hobbyists with that side of things. So, I mean, it was never, uh, never running for anything real big, but we had a blast with it. That's sweet, dude. What was it like uh, growing up at the racetrack with your dad? I know your dad can be, you know, for any junior driver who's gotten lit the fuck up by Dave Coates, I know your dad can be pretty pretty brutal. Was he hard on you when you were racing as a kid? or He was to an extent, but honestly, he was, it was probably, racing was probably the least hard on me he was. Like, he was worse, you know, on the baseball field, uh, football field, stuff like that. Um Racing, it wasn't, for whatever reason, wasn't as bad. Um, I just didn't do it as long enough. I mean, I obviously invest a lot of money into it, just like everybody else does. But baseball, I was playing my whole life. So when I sucked at baseball, it was like, dude, what the hell are you doing? And why am I wasting my time? But karting, it was like, dude, we do this as a hobby every few weeks. Like, I'm, I'm not really expecting you to go out there and just be some badass overnight. So um, 
it was a little different, but he was he was still hard. I mean, which is a good thing in the long run. I mean, always made me uh, competitive and shit like that. Oh yeah. <clears throat> so what? At what age? Like, so most of the people that are going to be watching this know you as an official and a race director now. Um, an official at some series, race director at the Star Series. <clears throat> what age did you decide that you were, you know, kind of done racing? And then what? At what time frame did you decide that you wanted to get involved? back in karting but at a different level at a, at a, from a different scene yeah i mean it just became financially too much as it does for most people in the fire racing i mean i i still want to do it still to this day i'd like to do it i'm obviously incredibly way too fat to do that so it's not <laughs> it's pretty relevant and i could probably last about five laps in a 206 right now so um but no, I mean, we kind of got out of it. Um, and then we kind of just started helping at MRP on the weekends. Uh, and then one thing to another kind of came along and it just happened. We went and worked uh, summer nats at Newcastle. Um, Stan Bernarski, op- ops guy for them, um, actually grew up with my dad and just down the street from me, ironically. So they, they knew each other and uh, he knew we were kind of doing some stuff out at MRP. So he had us come there and I mean, for whatever reason they liked us. I'm not sure why. I mean, we're not that great, but um, no, they liked us. And that summer Nats then went into our first super Nats, which I think was the 20th. Um, and then it's kind of just went from there. And obviously Joe being a part of all that and then starting stars. Um, again, for whatever reason, trusting me enough to be a race director. And uh, yeah, here we are. I, I love doing it. I mean, it's good to do with my dad and obviously the people you meet and dumbasses like Christian. So, <laughs> yeah, so what cool, is that dude. like? Like, like, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off, but I've always been curious. And it's the one job I think I've never had it in karting or at a kart track. Um, but being race director, like you're, you're always at pissing somebody off at some point, right? Like the reality of it is your job is, is really difficult because when it comes to a penalty, like somebody's going to get, the short end of that stick and vice versa right so what has that been like like and you've been at it for two or three years now as a the actual race director itself other than just a marshal or somebody with some say and some penalties before but that transition to where now you have to communicate back to team owners back to drivers um and, and really put a lot more weight on your shoulders to do that job like what's that been like for you no, it's been good. I mean, it's just like any other job. I guess you just start taking on more responsibility. But I will say, like, I mean, when I was first getting into the national side of things, I was just a corner worker. I was lifting go-karts, 20-cart pileups. It was I, what I thought was fucking miserable. But I'm more tired after a day of race directing than I was after lifting go-karts and turn two at Super Nats. Like, it's just mentally exhausting, obviously. But it's rewarding, too. I mean, when you have people telling you that, you're killing it and they go from one event to the next to say like even the first year to this year how much growth you know you've gotten in that position um it's pretty rewarding i mean i i'm sure there's bad comments out there too but for the most (laughs) part like from what i've seen on just little things here and there on social media i mean i people praise me in a good way which makes me obviously feel good but at the end of the day i'm there to put on the best show so i i don't really care that much if you like me or not, I, you got to do what's right. And you got to hold up to what the series is uh, all about. Yeah. I mean, ironically, you and race didn't necessarily see eye to eye that, uh, <laughs> that first year of stars. Um, um no, I we remember. got along. It was, yeah. Good. I mean, you got yeah, along. We just had time. hard conversations, sure. which is the part that I, that's what I like really liked about him is, you know, you, some races you go to the guy's like, well, it's my way or the highway. And I'm like, dude, fuck off. Like, that's not how yeah. this conversation is going to go we're going to have a discussion about it because you're going to tell me why you came up with that decision if I disagree. And if I've at the end of the conversation, like it was with me and Alec, we didn't quite agree on it. uh, This one particular instance. And, you know, we shook hands and said, all right, well, I understand now how you officiate and I will race within those parameters and that's it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that's what kind of what it boils down to is like, you really have to have a backbone in this. And that's something that I definitely like praise my dad in. <laughs> he, he's, he's given me that part of it, but I also have the little more people skills than him. And he would tell you that firsthand, like he couldn't have had that conversation with you. I don't think uh, probably would have bowled over a little bit, but uh, my thing's always been, which I think that first kind of interaction I had with you has always been, 
I just want them to walk away with a little better headspace than they came into the conversation. We might not have to agree. We're not going to agree on it. I'm not going to change my call just based on you laying into me for three classes that were on track while I'm over here dealing with it. Um, I'm not necessarily going to change my mind because of it, but as long as you walk away and you're like, I mean, I would come to this guy's, this guy's race again. Uh, I think that's, that's the key thing there. Yeah, dude. And obviously something we value a bunch at the stars program is transparency. So like in a sense, it's transparency both ways, because obviously if you get a penalty called on you, it's your responsibility to prove that that penalty was incorrect. Um, which is, you know, kind of something that it's hard to teach the community to kind of own that aspect of it and make sure they have cameras on the carts and things like that to protect themselves. Because at the end of the day, without a video system, we're humans. People are going to make the wrong call. People are going to see things the wrong way. But I think having that transparent discussion is so imperative to like what STARS stands for in the sense that it's like, listen, we were all racers. We all know what it's like to fucking bone somebody in the corner and get away with it. And we know what it's like to be totally clean and get a penalty. So I think having that, um, that level of communication, even between, you know, people like race who tend to be a bit of a pain in the ass with officials, I think it's really important. Yeah. What no, defines I, I a pain in the ass with an official though? Let's, let's start there. Listen, because, <clears throat> let, right. I actually, this is a good question. This is an honest question because I absolutely will funnel through a rule book if there's a penalty assessed and figure out some way somehow if if there's a way that i feel like i am right i will bring that to the table every I mean, single time isn't dude, that you're within not wrong. my jurisdiction so yeah you're not wrong and i much? think like it's not blatant bullshit and i go oh yeah i dumped that guy and i'm i didn't do that well yeah if it's on video that i did it I'm, yeah i did it and most of the times when it's a pushback or something it's pretty valid but um you know, what justifies like unreasonable at that point to a race director? Cause there's obviously there's out there, like we've seen plenty of situations over the years where people are just over the top. Like, are you fucking kidding me crazy when they come and try and protest something or get away with something or, or get something reversed or whatever it may be. Where's that fine line in the stand in the sand? Yeah. I don't, I mean, I don't know. It's just tough. I feel like everyone's always going to try to find the gray area. Um, which like you said, is your right to do so. But, um, I think most of the time people find the gray area and just try to reword it another way t to defend their case. Um, when they know damn well, what we were meaning when we wrote that rule book, mm -hmm. um, at some point, uh, it defines, I guess, going back to defining a pain in the ass, like I'll have a conversation with you, I guess, for as long as you want, but at some point. Um, if we're just not going to agree to disagree, um, I hope you can just like shake my hand and like call it just like we did <laughs> in a way. Um, but like I said, I think it all boils down to everyone's going to find that gray area. Everyone really knows w what we meant when we wrote that. Um, it's just their goal to try to expose it. But, um, that goes back to the integrity thing. You got to just kind of hold up to what, why we know the rule is writ and yeah. just go from there. And at the end of the day, like you got to justify, like something's got to justify, like, is this really worth this time? This, yeah. you know, is it yeah. really worth it at the end of the day? Do we, do we know for a fact, this was something that we feel strongly about? Or are we just trying to get away with something like deep down? Obviously we all know that going into it. And some of us, I, I try not to waste that kind of time, but oh, dude. obviously it's, it's always, the, do. it's always the dumbest shit to be completely honest. <laughs> it's like dude coming up to me and he's like, uh, we finished 16th, but this dropped us to 19th. And it's like, dude, what the, what are we doing here? Like, why are we having this conversation? Like you, you blocked for 15th, we called it blocking and you ended up 19th. Like what? I mean, is it making yeah. a difference right now? And that's the shit that just drives me nuts with it. It's just like, mm. use it as a teaching point to your kid or your, to your driver that this is obviously not what this series wants and move on with it. Like, Obviously, I'm, I understand if this is like a race deciding like win that we're taking away here, shit happens. But most of the time, dude, it's like in qualifying or it's in freaking a practice that they're protesting something. I'm just like, wh why are we wasting each other's time here? Let's find what you did wrong and let's use it as a teaching point and just move forward. Yeah, dude, obviously I can't speak for Alec, but for me, it's like the level of respect someone comes at you with. 
Like, if you yeah. want to come up and have, like, a real grown-up discussion about, like, hey, we got this penalty. Why did you assess the penalty the way you did? What did we do wrong? If if I think we didn't do that wrong, I'm going to, you know, have that discussion, too. But, like, if you come up and you're immediately, like, fuck this series, you know, I'm never coming back. I'm going to call all my friends and make sure they never come back. Like, at that point, dude, right. I'm fucking... I'm done listening to you. Like, yeah. pack your shit. You can go home. There's other places to race. I think a lot more series are kind of starting to band together in that aspect of, like, dude, I mean, yeah, this is how we make our living. But, like, at the same point, if if we're not showing disrespect to you, don't come and talk to us that way either. Well, at the same time, like, <clears throat> let's be realistic. Your rules, USP cases rules, Scooz's rules, they're, they're all – pretty much the same like at the end of the day yeah. there's a couple little you know little penalties here or there that might be a little different assessed but other than that the general like how you act at the go-kart track and what's right and what's wrong i mean that's just that's across the board pretty much the same so there is no oh well this is different here or this is so effed up here or there it's just you know yeah you might not be getting your way today but it doesn't really matter when Alex dude, that works is my at favorite. three other series. Yes, <laughs> that is my favorite thing, dude. The first thing that comes out of people's mouths is just going livid. Like, this is not a thing at Scusa. I'm like, dude, you just don't see me. I'm in a lift there at that event. Or, yeah. like, I, I know I, I'm your point of contact at this series. Like, you don't realize that I'm also in the lift at that series and know the rule book there. Like, they all really do go hand in hand. There's little things that are different, yes, but. It's just the dumbest stuff that it's just like, Scooza would never do this. Or I'm like, dude, we did it two weeks ago when I was at their event. Yeah. Like, I mean, it's people don't realize that. Like, I mean, good help's obviously hard to find at, in this sport. Like, we all kind of work together and work in different series. Like, it it's just that's my favorite thing is when they're first thing. They're just and like Christian said, just no respect coming up to you and like pretty much just saying this series is ten times better because they'd never do this. I'm like, dude, yeah, I, was there think- two, I was there two weeks ago. Do you think when before you guys were in these positions now this feels like me interviewing you two because this is kind of cool like these are the sides of things that nobody has perspectives of as as a, as a customer like they they've never shared this perspective so as former drivers um do you think that doing this job would have changed you know seeing it from this side has did you treat it different when you were a driver did you treat you like you're being you've been treated 100% dude Dude, I would get I, so fired up. Dude, <laughs> no, I, yeah, but I'm a little different, though, because, uh, dude, I, if I, like, especially because I was younger, but, dude, if I w- even said the wrong tone to an official, my dad would have lit me up. Like, I mean, it would have never even got past three words before he was dragging out of me. And then he probably would have motherfucked the person, but um, <laughs> it would have never been me. So, I mean... In that respect, like, I, I would always treat an official with respect because, I mean, my dad pretty much instilled that into me that, like, dude, I mean, just like what I experienced now, I was like, dude, these guys have been out here for 10 hours in the sun all day. Like, they're doing, I mean, they're doing what they can. Like, we go back and freaking sit in the chair, drink water, sit under a fan, and get the cart ready for the next race in two hours. Like, these guys don't get, we don't get breaks when we're on this side of things. Like, Yeah, it's and you're just not all the ones out. racing, having fun out there. You're there to work. Yeah, so it's exactly. just a different deal. Yeah. So, I mean, I, yeah, I mean, I definitely had a little more fire when I was a driver and I probably overstepped my boundary once in a while, but I knew if my dad was over my shoulder, it was, it was a horrible idea to even go there. See, dude, my dad, even like having a track that he promoted and stuff, I didn't understand the back end of the sport at all. And I think that's something that like, I always encourage people, dude, one of my first lines that if someone comes up to me and starts lighting me up about this, that, or the other, it's like, cool, dude, I can't wait to get your application for the next race. Like, if you think it's a problem, help make it better. And if you don't know what it's like to be on this side of it, then I don't want to hear it. It's it's hard, but I think that, uh, you know, it's real easy for, for people who are, like, focused on their program, their driver, things like that, to see it one way. But at the end of the day, it's, you know, it's hard to put on an event. It's hard to manage. You know, like, if we get 200 entries of the first two stars rounds, that's, like, 700 people that are at the racetrack. And it's hard to manage an event like that and keep everybody happy. So at the end of the day, I think that, like I said, dude, if people come up to you with respect, even if, uh, you know, what you're coming to us with is something we did wrong or whatever, you're going to get met with such a better response. If you come up and are like, hey, dude, you know, 
thanks for everything you do, but you shit the bet on this. Let's talk about it. Like that's always going to work. Yeah, I mean, it boils down to if you're going to have a fighting chance to like get me to overturn something or something, you better come up to me with like some sort of respect or I'm really not even going to be the time of day. Obviously, if you bring me freaking clear cut evidence, it's a little different. But um, if you walk up and you're just immediately a dick, like it's just not ever going to end that well. I feel like this is just like negotiation 101. (laughs) <laughs> you, know, oh, yeah. you want to negotiate with somebody Absolutely. you gotta kiss ass yeah, just a I mean, little it's, bit I guess it's I mean it's being a salesman type of thing like, yeah. I mean you gotta make your pitch but if you're gonna piss somebody off that you're trying to sell something to on the first jump like it's the sales not gonna work so well, there's like I mean I remember one specific family last year that you, you watch like the disrespect and the poor kid like gets the, the negative backlash of your own disrespect as a parent to an official and gets them kicked out and you're like great like now like what do you tell your child on the way home when you get dumped from an event there's because you mother fucked one of the officials <laughs> like, Dude, like there's what are we teaching them here probably the worst feeling i think i've had from this side of the sport is like having to throw a parent out knowing damn well that throwing the parent out means the kid's never coming back either even though the kid did nothing wrong like whether it's families, fucking parents scrapping in the scale line, or like uh, we had a kid, a uh, dad, like throw his uh, uh, front spoiler at a kid in the scale line. Like it's really, dude, it's scale line issues. Like we we kick more people out for scale line shit than anything else. But there's nothing sadder than like a perfectly innocent kid being there, like, hey, dad, stop, it's okay, it's fine, and dad's just fucking hauling off on an official. It's like, dude, you're not. You're not doing good by your kid here. Yeah, yeah. and it, it does suck for the kid, but at the end of the day, like, we don't need that family in the sport. I mean, that's what's making this shit bad, and that's why, obviously, things that have gone down in this sport in the last however many months are the way they are. Like, the, those families just don't need to be around. I know it sucks for the kid, but, I mean, go play soccer or something, I guess. I don't fucking know. <laughs> like, it's just... Like I, I don't know. It's just not not good for the sport as a whole to have those kind of families in it. Well, it's not it good. It takes for, the whole atmosphere out of the, everything. Yeah, it's not even good. Like, I mean, that's just bad parenting in general. Like, why? We're. I, I feel like so many people get caught in the competition side of motorsports and racing, and they forget about the life lessons and and what we're teaching kids while we're at the racetrack. And it's something that, you know, maybe I also didn't realize as a kid, but as I've grown up now and become an adult and you see like how these children, you know, after coaching kids for five, 10 years at a time, you see how they have morphed into their parents at some point because of the way they acted. And, you know, like you said, your, your father never let you disrespect an official and you're a proper young dude or Christian's kind of an asshole Tunis, sometimes. Tunis style, yeah. So you know, totally understandable. The leash was a little. Yeah, looser. Doug Marsh. Doug Marsh has lit me up before, so it's all right. <laughs> yeah, see, it's a valid point, dude. My parents used to like kick me out of the house as a kid, and they'd be like, "Yeah, dude, go ride the RTA wherever you want. We'll see you at nighttime." The streets raised me, son. <laughs> okay, <laughs> right. Dude, the streets of Ohio, Ohio. like Ohio. Amish <laughs> street. <laughs> yeah. No. Yeah, dude. I try to be no, cool, dude. but did you I go think, to you leave uh, Christian's yeah. house and you just see horses and buggies and people that look like yeah. Christian with funny hats. hundred yeah. oh, yeah. percent, dude. Absolutely. <laughs> Same beard. He's got yeah. the total Amish beard thing going on, but that's it. Yeah, race uh race and I actually last week drove back to my house from Nashville, Tennessee after race wrecked a trans am car, the Music City GP. Yeah. And saw that, dude. That's pretty upsetting. Dude, yeah, he upsetting. he was yeah. like rolling down the road and just was like, "What the fuck?" Slammed on the brakes because it's just like a horse and buggy with their flasher on, like pulling into a Taco Bell to get some snacks or something, dude. Damn, dude. Can you imagine that cap of your bad ending of the weekend? You just mm. smoke a horse and buggy, dude. dude he was <laughs> just telling me while I almost that would have been a cap, dude. It would have been terrible. But while I almost just smoked this horse and buggy, he's telling me the story about how they get rear ended all the time. Yeah, dude. My <laughs> so, so the the track that my dad promotes is obviously in this area, and we had like a family on the way to the track lay out a horse and buggy in their rig and it ended up being like a 13 year old kid driving the buggy oh just cruising God. down the street by himself and like the kid was fine the horse was checked out the horse was starting fresh <laughs> but uh, it's like dude they're Jesus it's, Christ. it's it, it makes for it's brutal dude. interesting <laughs> travel around around the- so what was it uh like what's it like for you 
being able to go to races with your dad and like travel the country together, get to like work at all these different events, like father son duo. Now you brought your buddy Justin into the mix. So like the three of you just kind of get to travel around and hang out. Has that been a cool experience? Yeah, it's been good, dude. I can I honestly can't look back and picture it just being it by myself. And I don't know how long I honestly would have stayed in and if it was like just myself. So uh, it's been really cool to just obviously share the experiences outside of the racetrack. Obviously, on the racetracks, fun too, giving each other shit and me making fun of him not being able to see card numbers and stuff like that. But um, outside of it, doing all the fun stuff with uh, obviously all of our separate race families we got out there, like it's been a blast. And then it's been uh, cool to get Justin on board with some of this shit too. Yeah, his well, Super Nance was the first time he's been in Vegas, so it was pretty, uh, pretty, pretty good time. Vegas is a we were just talking to Mr. David Sarah about Vegas it's such a like gnarly atmosphere even what David Sarah said he was like that's the coolest karting event in the world especially if you're over 21 to just get to like party like crazy for nine days straight and hope you can make the show on Sunday dude it's probably like the worst race in the world for when you're under 21 though like think about these like mini drivers how fucking terrible they're their tuners are and shit like when they're waking up the next day and they fucking suck on track they're just like dude nope. they're probably just getting ripped on all day long you know the shit that, that i've like, seen tuners do in vegas we would get oh canceled a hundred percent for talking about that dude bad. Yeah. one one year no bullshit i'm still playing out of hammered for sure i'm still playing and i look up and my driver is walking to the track and i'm like huh he's up early that's weird and I'm like, again, out of it completely. And I'm like, wait a minute. Oh my God, it's 6 30 in the morning. I gotta get going. But like, no yeah. recollection of it whatsoever. That would have been an even better story if your driver was in the afternoon group. You're like, oh fuck, it's 2 p.m. What am I doing? Uh, no, yeah. I've never been that lucky. Every time I've worked for somebody, I've either done double duty, which is much preferred. Um, but yeah, the other times where it's everybody was in the morning. Every Dude, time. I've had. Well, I've kids had always be morning because they, the, the, there they wouldn't be anybody party. racing if it was the adults, dude. They, if they had to wake up that early, it would not be out there. Yeah, no. I uh, I had moments when I was working Super Nats, like obviously uh, many, many years ago, where like I was rooming with a mechanic, and I wake up at 3 a.m. because the mechanic brought a chick back to the room, and I'm like, who the fuck is this? And he's like, we're just rolling a joint. We'll fucking we'll be out of here in a minute. We're just hanging out. <laughs> And it's like, dude, you've got to be up and at the track in like two and a half hours. He's like, I'm just going to fucking stay up. I'm just going to stay up. We'll do it again tomorrow night. And that's that's my 20 seconds. That's the reality. Because of Super Nats. Yeah. That's, yeah, that's Vegas, dude. I mean, it's a cool event, though. I don't think there's anything wild. in the world that's like it. No. Dude, the Sunday after we're done, like, me, I mean, my dad usually taps out pretty early, but like, there's been times like, Maybe maybe thirty. I last year I got thirty minutes of sleep, dude. Had to wake up to catch the Uber to the fucking plane on Monday, and it was just so bad, dude. So bad. <laughs> but so have you ever it. got to experience the super nads from any position other than being like a worker with Scusa at the event, like a bottom? I have not, no. And I'd honestly, yeah, I'd like to somehow do that. I mean, maybe maybe one day, but I don't know what in what other capacity other than just going there to be a fan. Yeah, which dude, that's not a bad race to go be a fan at. Like I spent some time. No, I mean the, the racing's sick, dude. But. It's there is something special about street races, and especially about that race. Like that race brings almost as much merit as like being a world champion. So people. Are giving... No idea oh, what man. you just said, man. <laughs> you're, you're, I, I was you're... hoping that wasn't my uh, my audio, but yeah, your audio. Oh, it. Uh... We just had this issue with David Sarah too. I guess it's on my end now. Of its own. No, it was just your audio. Your video stayed the same. It was just it got faint. But so, uh, yeah, dude. I mean, I think that obviously to have a race like that where it's like so important and so renowned across like the international competition is pretty rad. Especially like our boy Race here has won one, so that's got to feel pretty yeah, good. Yeah, we got to stop t- telling people that. It was in a semi-pro c- category. It wasn't uh, wasn't it as official as it could have been, but I still do have it. Um, oh, that's it's totally a great race. Counts, yeah, it I mean, counts. I'm going to count it because the trophy's dude. the same. But David Sarah also, doesn't have one of those. This is true. Also, I don't know what I don't know what year won it, but I'm assuming the like Pro 2 category was pretty stacked then, too. Like 
Yeah, it was pretty good. And we got I mean, the race like, pro. Few years back, it was yeah. I mean, it was pretty stacked. I mean, it's not even a thing anymore, but it was pretty sweet at one point. Yeah, yeah, I mean, obviously the the nose to nose burnout with uh, Billy Musgrave was a highlight of Super Nats for me that year. Yeah, we tried that. It didn't quite work out as well for Billy or for me as well as it did for Billy, but uh, it was fun. But that that event is so special, like, and it's so cool that we at least have one of those in America. I actually feel like the IAMI Grands is is kind of like the East Coast version so far, as what's come back to be such a cool event. But um, the Super Nats is once in a lifetime for so many people i mean people like dave was talking to us you know last show about that and uh bringing kids from around the world like across the pond for something like that is and it's on our soil is just to me so important for the shows merit to the sport here for sure and and the efforts that those guys put in so and we get to show how good we actually are when it's on our terms it's a race that we're familiar with it's a you know the engine programs everything here the tires it's something we're familiar with usually it's us going to try and showcase talent over there in their element and it's their turn to come here and americans end up winning that thing most of the time which is pretty cool dude americans are crushing yeah. it overseas right now too though like uh enzo delaney these, yeah dude some of these young drivers like up. enzo uh ugo is absolutely just destroying overseas right now um obviously we've had some other drivers like brent cruz connor zilich uh those guys have done well you know racing in Europe. yeah dude i think um i'm pretty hopeful that a sergeant will be the next american f1 driver it would seem yeah. that way at least i, I feel like f1 teams too. are really messed up right now like they have plenty of options and like what's that whole deal that happened with oscar and it's not like real Oh yeah, dude! It's the, like uh, shit's going wild right Alpine, now. Alpine, Alpine release like, oh, Oscar Piastri comes to Alpine it's the same for twenty twenty three, dude. Yeah, and then it. and then Oscar Piastri's like, uh, actually, I'm not going to Alpine thanks to the press release. Well, I'm pretty sure he's going to McLaren anyways, because I think he they may have even announced it at this point that he's replacing Danny at McLaren. Bro, is there, is there like a driver that's not on McLaren at this point? I feel there's like, where are they putting McLaren drivers like? I just feel like everyone's going there. They're going to have, like, nine people in F1, nine in IndyCar. Dude, it surprises me that Gene Haas hasn't put in more of an effort to pick up an American driver because you've got to think the same what, way yeah. you get, like, German driver, German sponsor, Russian driver, Russian sponsors. I would think that American companies would be all over, like, Logan Sargent making it to F1 and backing a driver like that. Yeah, I don't, I mean, I don't, we're dropping F1 tracks all over in cities now and trying to get, like, what, now our third Grand Prix here. Well, yeah. I mean, why would we not want at least one driver on the grid? Like, the talent's there. Like, put somebody in there and let's see what we can do. Uh, obviously, it's growing because of the drama series that came out on Netflix. But, I mean, yeah, I, I don't know why we don't have someone in one of those seats yet. I think it's close. Like, even the kids that live in Europe that are from the States that are being basically raised, like Jack Crawford's another one that's coming up. So we have, like, multiple kids popping up that are American. And really, since Scott Speed, I don't think there has been really much to come through that that ladder system. But, um, yeah, it's surprising that there isn't one. Like, even with the sponsorship, like it does make sense where these guys are pulling their money from. And I honestly, I think it hasn't happened just because the Haas program hasn't quite proven itself yet worthy. You know, like an American company would probably back it if it was extra successful at this point or at some point. So, you know, even as a driver, if I'm Logan Sargent, that's not the first team I'm shooting for, obviously. So, you know, what it what what actually happens there? Yeah, I think obviously, too, as Americans, we just blast so much freaking into NASCAR too. So I think that's another thing that's kind of hurt us over the years is we've had, I mean, I feel like that's most kids goals, at least when I was growing up. I mean, I hated NASCAR, but I was always open wheel, but I feel like NASCAR has just been so prevalent in America. And we finally have some other, I mean, IndyCar has grown, I think a lot too. I mean, I think it's been pretty big the last few years. IndyCar in the last few years, I think is probably like the best open wheel Maybe up until this year with F1, but IndyCar has been the best open wheel program in the world. Oh, yeah, it's not even close. Dude, the competition level, the parity between teams, and, I mean, you're even getting some of these, uh, not lower level, but teams without the level of resources like Junkos and uh, 
HMD Racing, MSR, uh, MSR. Yeah. And they're, I mean, they're able to compete and be up front because of the structure of the program. The cars race so well together with how much arrows underneath the car. Um, yeah. That's something that F1 obviously, you know, did better <clears throat> this weekend. And maybe even that's a result of like Drive to Survive and, and Liberty Media, like buying F1 is they're like, hey, how do we make this more appealing for spectators who aren't into racing? You're going to get the diehards that'll watch it either way. But like if the racing's better, they're doing more street courses plus the show. That's going to bring people into the sport that weren't fans to begin with. Yeah, no, I definitely agree. I think so many fans of F1, you know, they're, they're, it's a hard thing. And that's where I think uh, even NASCAR is screwed up. And now they're trying to figure their way out is they, the fan base of Formula One for so long were, were, enthusiasts of what they're coming up with right like the ingenuity the engineering the the new latest and greatest thing you know watching the updates and really more or less on the team side of it and the the car build side of it more so than the show and the race itself um and they've done a good job bridging that gap because now they've enforced rules to create tighter racing and you're you know you look at every car on the grid now and they're, they don't look the same not one you know, that doesn't yeah, come no. from the same factory or same shop looks the same. And so it still kept that, that, that cool factor of it being totally up to you, but they put it in parameters where it's, it's evened out the racing so much, taking a page out of IndyCar's book. But the IndyCar thing is pure badass racing. I mean, as a driver, when I was growing up, I didn't, you know, we were, we didn't look at the Indy ladder because it was more or less an expense thing. Uh, more than anything, I mean, you can go buy a legend car right now for ten thousand dollars and race all season on forty or fifty thousand dollars, and hopefully get a sponsor and a late model the next year. And even that's only seventy to eighty, you know, to a hundred, depending on what program you're on. Whereas the intro step to the Indy ladder is F two thousand, or was at one point yeah. um, when I was a kid. And, and right then and there, you're going from a go karting budget, which for most of us at the time was in the forties or fifty thousand dollar ranges nationally, and you got to jump, jump right up to $200,000 a year to go run the first step. Yeah. You know, it wasn't yeah. even accessible for some people. So there's been so much that's happened now that has made some of those ladder systems more uh, feasible for people to get into. You know, sponsors are honestly, in my opinion, way easier to get at these levels nowadays. Um, I think at the professional level, it's a little bit harder. Um, but I feel like getting some support early in your racing careers is feasible now and it is doable versus before. And it gives you the avenue to kind of choose where you want to go. And I feel like everything's got a great mix of interest from even the karting community. Yeah. The sponsor thing, I think is pretty cool. I mean, I, I've seen more sponsors recently on carts than I've seen really in forever. I mean, the last few years, I think it's awesome to see that kind of stuff. I mean, it never, when I was racing, it wasn't a thing unless you just luckily found some, local business guy that you knew growing up or your dad knew growing up and he was like pity sponsoring you like it wasn't like they're actually investing in anything he didn't care about like getting his name out there but yeah obviously with stuff i mean not like this podcast but they don't want to be representing this but uh like with all the media and stuff i mean i feel like you can actually as a carter promote someone's brand and i think people are somewhat starting to see that if they do it right social media dude it's teams like race factory that put emphasis on teaching drivers how to market themselves and their brand that's the stuff that really ends up bringing value um you know like i've i've helped a few drivers fill out applications for like the red bull junior program and things like that and like one of the most important things they're looking for is your brand how many followers do you have? How much engagement are you producing? What what region what are you your posting? target? Yeah. You know, I'm like, I remember when I was a dude as a teenager. Oh my God. Nobody cared about me because I was posting dumb teenager crap. But even teenagers nowadays know better. You yeah. know, the ones that yeah. are shooting for a racing career, now it's etched in stone. Like, you don't act a fool. You, you know, you, you're always wearing your brand. Um, somebody's always watching, which is the truth. Like, that's just how yeah, it is. I mean, that's now. just the way the world is at this point. I mean, yeah. I mean, you can have your opinion on social media, but I mean, you got to brand yourself pretty much in every profession, and especially in racing. Just yeah. the way it goes at this point. It's the most important thing. It's cool that there's some programs like uh, 
I don't know much about it, but I've seen this open fender, which is kind of like yeah. crowdsourcing, trying to help kids get funding. I know uh, one of the first places I saw it was actually race trying to get funding for the Nashville GP. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, that stuff's cool. Like, that, I mean, that right there, that's a simple website. You go create a profile, you create a campaign, um, and it's a QR code that you can basically give to anybody and they can contribute what they want to contribute. I mean, it's similar to like a GoFundMe, but it's more aimed towards the racer and sponsorship. You know, you can dictate where things go on the car, what that budget's allocated towards, you know, and it's a secure place of payment. It's not, you know, there's so many <laughs> sponsors. You're like, oh, yeah, I get tire money for the Super Nats. And the, he's like, so how do I pay you? Like, well, cash isn't going to do it. That guy can't write that off for his business, right? That's a shady deal. So it gives a sponsor an opportunity for a secure payment and things like that. So, I, I mean, I highly suggest anybody that's watching this, sign up for an open fender account the worst you know worst case scenario nobody contributes but it's something that extra for you to put out there um to hopefully market and campaign yourself yeah i um you know obviously with uh with things like that it maybe gives some drivers that don't have the funds the opportunities to get especially with like karting i know that obviously you didn't source all of your ride for the music city gp from open fender um but what are some things as a driver who's made like big level deals obviously um we were together at the music city gp i got to watch you interact with like the guys from armada and some of these partners you had what are some of the things drivers should know going into those relationships or even starting that conversation that are like really important for them to have, you know, in their arsenal or have tools that are like going to propel them forward in that situation. I mean, the biggest thing with any of that stuff is at the end of the day, the amount of times I've gone after rides like this and been shot down or whatever, like the the best thing you can do is remember to always have a positive attitude. Cause if if this is something you want to do, it's a dream of yours. That stuff's not going to get you down. You move on to the next one. You try and find something in reality, like with a sponsor, the biggest thing is benefiting them somehow. Like it's obviously going to benefit you when they cut you a check for 40 or $50,000 to go run this deal. Clearly you're getting what you want out of the deal. How do you justify them doing so? And there's so many ways you just have to get creative with it or use, you know, companies out there that get creative for you with that and management and marketing approaches for these, these guys. But the biggest thing is being yourself. Like, for me, I tell people all the time, like it's not you, you don't go after companies just because you're seeking money. At the end of the day, when you're genuine with them and there's a vibe that you guys like have a connection to each other and there's something that you're passionate about, like you're not at that point, you're not selling anything. You're never supposed to be trying to sell somebody on something. At the end of the day, you want to represent brands and companies that you're passionate about. So I would start with making a list of brands that you use every day. I mean, I love Sharpie pens, you know. I've definitely sent them a resume. You sign a lot of autographs if you ever make it with that pen. <laughs> it could be cool to have. So you make a list of the things that you're interested in, the things that you already use in everyday life. You reach out to those companies because it's something you could actually genuinely be passionate about. And that's what most of these companies are looking for nowadays anyways. That's the simplest thing I can say. If this will translate very well, but there's a photograph of Race Liberante <laughs> signing some fucking junked race car parts after he backed into the wall. That Nashville. says Armada all over it. <laughs> that says Armada all over it. Dude, that's going to make that kid's dream. Like that's That piece of bumper is going right up on that kid's wall when he went home. And now you've made a Race Liberante fan, yeah. which I think is I also mean- like... And I was that kid at one point. Like, dude, I, I'm a second-gen racer. My, I got to grow up at the short track with my pops. I got to go to the, the road courses with him. And I was that kid. And dude, I he gets so mad at how many tires I'd bring home and broken body panels from the circle track. But I was that kid. I wanted that autograph piece because that's maybe a guy I looked up to or some guy I thought was a jackass for wrecking a car or something. I mean, there's a memory <laughs> attached to all of them for sure. But, yeah. um, you know, even that, that's a piece of something that they're that's branded – with the guy that just supported you to, to hand off to somebody else that's going to be in somebody's man cave the rest of their life. Yeah, that's cool for sure. Especially um, you see that like IndyCar events in particular, maybe even NASCAR events, but really the IndyCar event in Nashville, the Music City GP, it kind of astonished me how many people were in the paddock area. Like normally the the team area where the garages are and stuff, it's a little more 
controlled, a little more cut off. But I felt like there were so many people getting to get in. And, like, obviously we hung out at the Aero McLaren tent a lot throughout the weekend. But just the l- amount of people that went up and were able to, like, engage with drivers like Pato or Felix and spend even just a few moments with them and stuff, I think that stuff makes a big impact for the sport too. Well, I've been preaching that for years. I mean, the one thing that I remember growing up and going, and I was a huge motor, I'm still a huge motocross and supercross fan. Um, growing up, going to those events, like going to a supercross, and you literally get to walk right up to that rig and just watch them work or potentially get the muted rider or you know, even get to talk to some of the crew guys because I was maybe one of the kids that was into the wrenching side of it too and seeing their cool toolboxes. And you just get to see and be a part of the atmosphere. I feel like even, you know, that's something I wish it. I know it's difficult because of insurance reasons and whatnot at go-kart tracks, but that maybe this is a good question. Like, I wish that it was more open. Like, I, I wish you didn't have to spend $25 or $10 or whatever the daily wristband is to come spectate and come see go-kart racing. And, you know, you're seeing it in professional motorsports now. I mean, Las Vegas Motor Speedway's whole garage setup has a whole walkway above it with glass windows so you can see down and what they're doing live time. And that stuff and getting more interaction with the fan or creating a fan or even in our world, a participant, um, getting them to be able to come in and be hands on without it being weird. Like, dude, you can't have a random walk by your tent (laughs) and you not be like, what the fuck are you looking at? You know what I mean? Like, it's so sad that some random dude can't walk around by your easy up or, you know, half these tents have closed walls and you can't see anything. And you're like, man, how's this guy ever supposed to learn? But we all look at him like he's an alien when somebody just walks up and stares at your go-kart. I think, the thing uh, is, I don't think like, I don't think like pit passes or whatever are really what's stopping that in karting. Though. Yeah. yeah like, I don't, at I, the end of the culture, day, like, dude, it's the walls on think, tents. We all think that <laughs> karting is like the most badass thing ever, but like Christian said it before and it's just true. It's just not for whatever reason, flashy to outside people who just coming to watch a race. Like they'd rather go to a short track at night, I guess. And then, I mean, just like you said, the motocross thing, I mean, one thing I don't really like is drag racing, but that's a really cool experience is it is going into the yeah. pits there and watching them tear a whole motor down, back up, and then just getting blasted by Nitro, like for, and then walking out of there, like almost falling over. Like, I mean, that kind of stuff's awesome for the fans. Like, that's why they're, I don't know about now, I haven't seen a race in a while, but I mean, their stands were always packed too at right. NHRA events, like just because. It all boils down to the fan experience, and I think that's something IndyCar, like you said, this weekend is getting much better at. Because, I mean, there's been a lot of races in the last, if you go years back, there was 2,000 people in the stands. And, like, that's how series is just going to fold eventually, but I really think IndyCar has been super strong in the last few years. Well, and how full of shit are teams that they think someone walking by their tent and seeing inside is going to, like, give them the secrets to winning? Like yeah. the reality is if you can walk by the outside of someone's tent and see what they're doing to win that like, it's probably not the, you know, they're playing in a gray area or even just being flagrant. Cause like the stuff that you're doing to win, it probably happens on the engine table inside the trailer or it's, you know, driver coaching, driver development, stuff like that. Like at the end of the day, every major team out there has the same level of equipment, the same level of experience and knowledge. Like, that's not the difference, dude. So why not? You know, I, I've seen a few teams this year that I really commend, like having the half wall on your tent. And like when people walk by, they can see, you know, what you guys are doing. And even people that are in the sport, like if you're, you know, maybe a, a mom and pop type of team and it's it's your your parents and you going to the track in a trailer by yourself, for you to be able to walk around and like look into Trinity's tent and see their operation and like how organized everything is and stuff like that. I think that that's just a cool experience. And like I said, I don't think you're, you're not giving anybody any secrets doing that. that The bottom line is, I mean, dude, you, you could have some ACDC back in the day could have walked up to Trinity's cart tent and they could have gave us all the tips they wanted to. And I still would have went and finished the pack. (laughs) Like it, yeah. It's not going to matter, and it's only going to grow another like name in the sport, and then that could bring you a customer in the next couple of years. A hundred percent. I mean, that person that you just helped out could hone his craft in the next few years in carding, and then he could come up to you and be like, "Hey, do you have a seat open? You just right. got a new customer out of that." Like, I don't know. It's just a extremely massive ego sport, 
and which is good. I mean, I like the competitiveness, obviously, and stuff like that. Well, it kind of has to be, right? <laughs> yeah. It does. Yeah, I mean, it has. I mean, it has to be. At the end of the day, I mean, you if you're gonna make a name for yourself, um, obviously branding, but you got to be finishing on top too at the big events. So I mean, you you got to have an ego, you got to have a chip on your shoulder. But uh, I wish there was just certain aspects of it that were a little more welcoming to some people. Dude, I even uh, I had a conversation walking out of the track last week with races manager Jackson, and it was like, he was like, man, it's like an ego thing. I was like, yeah, but if you want to be a successful race car driver, you've got to have some element of like, I'm the best there fucking is, and everybody else is here to finish second, or you're never gonna win. Yeah, like that's, no, that's kind true, of 100%. to an extent that's what it takes, you know, for yeah, better I think- or for worse. Yeah, I think that's something that I honestly love so much about Stars, though, too, is we have just, like, the perfect, like, mix as of right now of both of those. Um, and, I mean, even in our last year, like, our K Junior champion, I think it was the first year that we were doing decent, was just a dad and son. And yeah. it was the coolest thing ever, like, to see them win the championship and how much that, like, meant to them. Like, that's the cool shit in the sport um, that kind of goes unnoticed by everyone that's – so so deep into all of it yeah you're still getting a little bit of that like um parent driver duo and things like that with like ian quinn and his dad i know they're obviously under macron's tent but um a couple of those guys i think that keeping that atmosphere at stars is probably internally the most important thing to us is like yeah yeah, it, it becomes a little cutthroat you know on sunday afternoon people definitely care about what's happening but yeah, and I like, want that side of it too, obviously. Yeah, for sure. But people still, you know, I see a lot of like team managers hanging out and talking, you know, standing in between their tents and and discussing things. And that gets back to us like, oh, I talked to this team manager and we were thinking X, Y, and Z could be good or whatever. It's not stuff you get at other series, like at other series. And I get that, you know, people maybe take the other series more serious and that's just a byproduct of that. But I think that, the camaraderie is like a really cool part of what we've got going on right now. Well, I think yeah, that's, a, it's a, <clears throat> it kind of fills a void in this area that, you know, is necessary. Like I, I feel like there was such a void in when I, you know, being from California, when we lost a couple of regional s- series that we had that were really strong, most of the kids ended up going from club to national, like right away. And, yeah. and honestly, actually the teams like, Dude, the national teams were participating at the club races and just fucking people up there. And it's like, dude, we didn't always put on sets of tires in 206 every weekend. Like, that's not normal, you know, yeah. for the club racer. But when you show up and you spend twice as much because that's what you're accustomed to, like, even some of the teams don't belong at the club level. But definitely the drivers need that stepping stone platform. You know, I tell I, we have so many customers that love stars because it's kind of that in between you're going to have eight to 10 people in the class that are pretty stout that run for top twenties in the national stuff. The top five guys are right there in that mix of the top 10 that can always win. And the guys that are running fifth to 10th run 10th to 20th at the nationals. And wherever you blend into that the rest of the way, whether, you know, you're creating a platform for people to get attached to for, for a goal. Like when that kid wins that championship and it means so much to them, it's because that's what was built, you know, yeah. by you guys like yeah. you go win a wk championship right now and you're like fucking sweet you know well, like it used cool. to be the best you know what yeah. i mean like it used yeah. to mean so much dude but... when i was a kid um wk was like that was the shit like when yeah. i got even like stuff like i got my first wk poll at alex home track in michiana and i was like holy fuck like i'm here with the best of the best and now it's like you can just kind of pay to show up and walk out with an eagle. It's but it's, Yamaha, like it's cool. But yeah, dude. Yamaha, no, actually, it was it was oh, HPV. Oh, oh, oh yeah, that's HPV. right, dude. It was or, HPV. That's my dad. That's what my dad ran. Yeah, four pipe. Yeah, yeah dude, four pipe was like, that was so fun to watch them. Yeah, and it was in the rain, and it was. I mean, it was a pretty like I grew up racing in that area with like Connor Daly, Joseph Newgarden, uh, Sterling Shaw. Actually, humble, humble like brag. humble brag. Yeah, humble um, brag. He he means he got his ass kicked weekly by weekly. No, by. he'll tell you he tell you that he beat Connor and um, Joseph from like 
it should have been him out there this weekend. And... Dude, it's, <laughs> I'm telling you, dude, if I, if I was 100 pounds less, I'd be fucking yeah. All right, 100? 100? Only 100? It's, it's only 100. Yeah. It's only 100. Only? Yeah, if I was... This isn't a fucking a, intervention. This is a podcast. If I was a foot taller, Christian, and a little bit faster, I'd be in MLB too, but I'm not, so... But um, I remember, like, we it was in the rain, obviously, and it's fucking... Uh, being a, a chubby, a chubby friendly. fella, fat boy friendly. Yeah, dude. Um, I was way. able to make weight as a kid, but uh, we qualified on pole and HPV, and then it stopped raining. Went to take the green in the final, and it just fucking ate shit. Fell on its face. Wouldn't go anywhere. I'm fucking leaning her out, trying to get her to move, and it won't move. I drop back to like twentieth, and then like go through turn one, chugging up the hill, and the thing's just like blah 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 and dies. <laughs> And I fucking pull in, and there's just like three inches of water sitting in the bottom of the air box that we just totally just didn't clean it yeah, out. Just, nobody cleaned it out. No hole drilled in the bottom of the air box. It's like, well, I guess that's one way to learn it. Yeah, but dude, oh, like yeah. that used to be. At least I don't know how it was on the West Coast for you, Ray. We had like, IKF. IKF on the Region East Coast, Seven was like a big deal. A Duffy yeah. was like meant as much as a Super Nats win at one point. Yeah, so for us, it was the same thing with a Screaming Eagle. Like, that was like, if you have one of those on your shelf, you're a badass. And it's a bummer to see it not be that way anymore. But I think, you know, it's probably a byproduct of, like, uh, not necessarily corruption, but, like, there were things happening in that organization that people didn't like for an extended amount of time. And other programs like uh, like the Marks program at USPKS and everything, they kind of filled that void of, like, being the upper echelon premier program in this part of the country. So it's just the evolution of the sport, man. Things change. For it's sure. Normal. Go back yeah, to uh, funny rains. Oh, sorry. I don't want to interrupt you there. No, you go can ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say a uh, funny rain story. I've raced in the rain one fucking time, dude. And Dave Coates not knowing what he's doing because Dave Coates would just pack his shit and go home if it started raining. Pussy. So – this time, dude, we had rain tires. We're like, I'm in a championship fight here with seven other kids in the Yamaha can, dude. So he fucking puts me out there. It's raining. Suck the front tires all the way in and the backs all the way out. Did the complete opposite, dude. I just went and did like pirouettes for like eight <laughs> laps, dude. I come back oh, in. I'm like, that. I'm like, what was that, dude? I like, I'm. I know I'm not like ever <laughs> out there, but like, I I'm not that bad. There's no way. And he was just, I'm like, and then I like turn around and I look at every other cart that's in the scale line in front of me. They're all squared complete, up, dude. Yeah, squared up, fronts out, backs in. <laughs> like, and mine's just like this, dude. I'm like, what the fuck? What are we doing here, dude? While you're the mechanic. Uh, I actually. I actually better off to just pack it up. I was lucky enough to watch Race Liberante run his first ever rain race. And uh, it was in California and you oh, were a grown ass one. adult. Yeah. Which like coming from. Racing on the East Coast, that's crazy to me that you fucking made it that long without racing in the rain. Yeah, that just in California, it just wasn't something we did. Like most people at the club level or the, and we didn't really do it much at the regional level because it just never really rained. But if it did, we would most of the time, like, oh, well, that's our drop, pack it up and go home because you, yeah, I mean, yep. that was it. We didn't, nothing gets rusty where I'm from. Like, this is crazy to me. But since I moved to the East Coast, you got to disassemble a go kart every weekend, clean the axle every damn weekend. Dude, you can leave your go kart outside in some spots in California. Especially at fucking it'd be fun. Pittsburgh, dude. Yeah, it's rough. That always rain in Pittsburgh. Rains all the time, dude, dude. I can't put a pipe on the shelf in my house without it rusting. Like it's the yeah. craziest thing in the world. So, dude, yeah, we just even, different. We used to go out and test in the rain. Like it would be raining, and we'd be like, "All right, backup motor, uh, you know, rain wheels and tires. Let's go pound laps." Yeah, I don't know. That's what we do now. I mean, that's I, why you put it on the pole, dude. Yeah, a hundred percent. Yeah, it was all the time. upper. It was yeah, dude. It was that upper upper body weight. Just you guys like, didn't like think even on a practice day, no. like clean the water out of the air box. I wasn't like. Dude, I listen. My dad started racing go karts in nineteen seventy four. Like I kind of, I was like 12, 13 years old. I was entrusting him with that, and he dropped the ball. That was like well, oh, in, in his defense, Man, dude, no he got into karting before plastic air was even an air box like yeah there was dude. no air box it was a filter nope he was like cover that shit with your hand yeah. it's funny i Got actually like we band. never even we never even played this with uh i 
didn't even I did not even see the start of that video, but it uh it was just David Sarah funny. picking up what appears to be somebody else's rain cover and deciding it's his own <laughs> and fucking just hauling off with it, dude. But yeah, um, I mean I dude, that's cool another to... thing that's like a blessing. Like you talking about flooding your engine. Do you remember when there was no such thing as rain covers for air boxes and you had Bro, to like get crafty? That dude, weekend Gatorade bottles was always it, dude. <laughs> no, Gold I think bottles, that weekend Gatorade bottles. The the like oval garbage bin from the bathroom of a hotel. Yeah, like, see, those are actually better. the best. That's dude, the those fucking are the best, best, dude. 100%. KFC I've seen the KFC bucket. KFC yep. bucket's not bad. Yep. Um Man, there's some I've seen some interesting ones. I think probably my favorite rain cover I've ever seen was on a 206, and I think it was your fucking demon brainchild at uh in Miami at the hard rock was Zach Skolnick, dude. Oh, when I made the event all the way around the back of the go kart, (laughs) yeah, and that that was gangster, dude. And the parking lots flooded like the one section had like seven inches of standing water, and everyone else is like slowing down and going around it and zach's just straight through it yeah dude it was that was cool. probably the best idea i've ever had when i asked them like oh well, how can this come out wherever and they're like yeah i don't see why i'm not i'm like okay <laughs> cool thanks Go guys home depot <laughs> yeah good talk uh, Chili with the tech funny. and got popped with it dude nope no nope. that <laughs> it right through dude we were one of the only three that even finished the race yeah Alec, I've got a question I actually wrote down because I didn't want to forget to ask you. Who's uh, your least favorite carding dad and why? Carding dad? You're not, you're not gonna tell me. Dude, are can you? I guess? Can I guess? No, I'm not I'm not saying that. Come on now. I ain't doing that. Yeah, that's race. Bad. Race, you go ahead and guess. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I should. Uh sure, I get it. Pass. Pass. I know who my least favorite carding mom is. Do, are you gonna say that one out loud or <laughs> I don't know her name, which is the beauty of hold it. Hold on, but... hold on. Here we go. You ready? Track mom certified. The cool track moms, like not the fucking Karens. Those... We like track moms, dude. Yeah, the cool ones. There's so many cool ones. Actually, can we like give them some dude, appreciation I do for actually, once? Uh, Vote on a favorite track it, mom I right totally now. We do have a least favorite dad, I think, but I'm just going to keep that to myself. You can yeah, tell us off there. He's been thinking about it the whole time. My <laughs> least favorite like, mom's the one who tried canceling the thinking it was sexist and not like anti-feministic to not have grid chicks like oh we're back to the grid chicks dude two episodes yeah i'm gonna long. ride that out for a little while but that's my least favorite carding mom the one that sent that shit in because how dare you like those women are within their damn rights of being feminists or whatever the hell they are to choose so but yeah Track mom um, certified. Yeah, bro. cool what's track the, mom what's certified. The difference between, what's the difference between me getting paid to be a race director and them getting paid to be grid girls? Like, That's the what point. Is that? Nothing. Like, it was their choice. This is your choice. You literally get abused way more than those oh, women ever were. So much. Yeah. So much. Yeah, dude. yeah, we've actually started a GoFundMe to pay for therapy for Alec after Stars Weekends, after just getting fucking dude. lit up by many Yeah, days. but you didn't need that after I was out at the seat. We're good now. He's fine. Dude, yeah. the, the reality, the I forgot to talk about this last time we talked about the fucking canceling mom, was one of the things she threw at us was, Oh, all you think women are good for is uh, standing around looking good with umbrellas. And I'm like, have you ever been to one of our races? Because literally women fucking run the entire show. Like we've got Nikki. The most important all, person in our whole thing. All, of, <laughs> all of the operations for not only stars, but for the NKA. Like basically carding in North America doesn't happen without Nikki Center. And then you've got Sierra runs control. She started as a grid girl and like worked her way all the way up to being one of the most important people at the facility. Yeah, she handles um, like the whole light system, right? Yeah, she does. So what she does is like she runs the light system. Um, we also there's two people that run the light system. There's the lead, which is uh, Sierra, and then um, Christian Gomez, who works down at right. Amar Motorplex, works with us. Um, but Sierra runs control. So basically, um, you know, she's telling the grid when to go to two minutes, one minute fire. She's closing the grid when the leaders get to the commitment cone. Um, she's a, she is directly assessing and managing the track. So if there's like a big pile up, she's the one that decides what sectors go yellow. Um, she instructs like the corner workers on when they're safe to run to the uh, incident, what to do, things like that. 
And basically, like, it's 100% on her to keep the event on schedule and going all weekend. So, like, yeah, literally so far. absolutely lit up somewhere else. Yeah, dude. We've named, the <laughs> like, two of the three most important positions of the track, both women. So, fucking just saying. Uh, we definitely <laughs> think that saying. women are worth way more than looking good. But guess dude. what? There's also some women that fucking look good, and they enjoy that type of work. So, yeah. I think we should embrace it all. Dude, I well, think it's sick. Like, even at that Trans Am race, I think it's uh, uh, one of the Andretti's. Um, Adam Andretti's wife, she's, they're parked right next to us and he's like a factory or whatever. He's like borderline paid driver for this team. And his wife is underneath the car, checking and fittings on all the lines after the practice session. Busting and her like, ass, dude. Dude, that's getting sick. greasy and dirty. And I walked straight up to her. I was like, dude, that you are awesome. Like, that's so cool that you're involved in this. And just to any degree that, and she's got a smile on her face all day. She loves it. The girl on the other side. There's a girl working on a team on the other side that we kind of worked with that team and she's the tire manager. So, which is a huge important role in car racing, managing all the tires and like killing it all weekend long. I'm just watching this chick hustle around. I'm like, dude, this is sick. Like there's a whole IndyCar team full of women working on an IndyCar team. Like dope. Like, that is actually super fucking cool. And the fact that like Simona Di Silvestro is driving and yeah. dude, the like involvement from women in motorsports, like, that's it's it was just so out of touch it's the opposite of everything that we actually stand for and do in the sport like inclusivity is such a part i mean if you're inside of a stars meeting in the mornings like the the different types of people from different walks of life and things that that work with us and it's literally i mean i don't know how alec feels but like it's my favorite people on the planet like it's such a family environment we have uh, in the stars event app, we have like a race control room that's supposed to be for back end communication during events. We are literally in there bullshitting with each other and talking every single day. Um, and it's like, it's, it's people from all over the place. So I just think it's like, I get it. Um, I mean, I, obviously I think everyone's entitled to their opinions, but. Well, that's why she's my least favorite party. Our, that's all. Yeah. Her opinion sucks. Her opinion, opinion fucking sucks, sucks dude. For sure. Really, what it boils down. To. For sure. Yeah, I mean, dude, it's hard to pick a favorite track, mom. Um, well, no, we can't do that. Can't no, do that. It's, no, that's bro, oh, that's no. not good. Yeah, that's a bad idea. <laughs> fucking follow. That's that. how we get uncertified. Yeah, yeah. there's so that many up. cool like, moms. Wow, and that's favorites. what I wanted to say. Like, there's so much appreciation to see these moms. Like, even my mom, like, was only involved at a short period of time in my racing career, like when I was a little kid and it was cute and like, he's having fun. But when it started getting serious is when she was like, okay, I'm going to take a back seat. I'll watch you when I can kind of thing. But to see some of the moms that are at the track that even pick up, like Megan Olds picks up side jobs and does some registration stuff to help yeah. pay for the racing or like just ones that are super involved and like there for their kid it's to me is super cool i think lydia small's mom i i saw see all the time she's from the west coast mom works on the go-kart brings her in their sprinter van like does it mom and daughter yeah and like that's super cool so huge appreciation to all the moms out there so they can't be a favorite because they're all no cool. they're all the best dude there's so many good ones my mom yeah. used to come to the track and score by hand fucking all the time as a kid dude every class before just transponders down existed numbers. Yeah, dude. I mean, transponders existed back in the nineteen we're hundreds. We're back in the nineteen hundreds, <laughs> dude. We're talking about like super small, little, you know, middle of nowhere racetracks. There were probably a ton of moms that did that job back in the day. For sure. And showcoats, showcoats has never shown up to the track, dude. Dude, my mom was fucking. Bru I remember the first time I flipped, I straight up shattered the back <laughs> of my hand under a Yamaha engine as a little kid. And I was like, my dad was, you know, taking the shit apart, getting ready to pack up. And my mom comes down from the tower. She's like, what are you doing? He's like, I'm packing the shit up. He's hurt. She's like, get back in the go-kart, dude. And I was like, wait, what? She was like, if you don't get back in that go-kart right now, you are fucking done. We are selling all of this stuff. You will never race again in your life. And I was like, all right, I guess I'm going to drive. And <laughs> like. At that point, my dad gets the shit put back together. I go out and run the final. I pass everybody except for the kid I flipped over and, like, just wouldn't go anywhere near him. And then the next morning, we go to the doctor, and he's like, oh, your hand's shattered. And it's like, thanks, Mom. It's fucking This is where Alec Coates would have had to step in and gone, well, he's not fit to race. 
yeah. maybe we shouldn't do this. You gotta make the responsible <laughs> send call. It. Send it. Full send. Your race director here. Full oh, send. No, dude. Send. All the if time. Someone wants to go out there and badass with a broken hand. I'm all for it. Just don't take anybody <laughs> else out with it. I saw a driver that like uh, had a nasty sprint car incident, like lost control, uh, like function of his arm. Tape his hand to the steering wheel and fucking race a man cup race one handed. He's fucking legend, dude. Wow. Absolute legend. And now his kids racing, and his kids a little fucking savage too. It's I guess it runs in the family. Was your dad a racer at all? Race like did your dad uh, drive carts or cars at all before you were born? Yeah, he drove. Uh, he didn't do much professionally. Like he, the best he ever did was Atlantic stuff right, when that okay. was a big deal. Um, yeah, but. Other than that, he was a road racer. Road racing was huge in the 70s, 80s, 90s. Um, so he was a go-kart road racer for a long time on the West Coast. And, uh, yeah, so it's it's kind of always running the family here for sure. Yeah. But he doesn't even have any crazy stories. I, I Actually, I've only – I think I've watched him crash one time, and it, I was scared shitless. I was like five, but it wasn't that bad. So nothing cool to report. I mean, I watched my dad cool. flip, dude. My dad flipped, and it kind of spooked me for a little bit, dude. The HPV head motor head came down on his ankle, and just fucking filleted him open, dude. Ooh. He still like he still has when he gets in a pool. It feels like his like skin's flapping on the top of his like right foot. Oh, what? Because of where like the motor fins, bur- the motor <laughs> fins burnt him. Yeah, what, pretty much. Yeah. Damn. I watched my dad bone the wall in turn one at mid Ohio <laughs> in a formula car, just fucking straight off the exit, like a uh, wheel bearing failure. And uh, my mom started crying and everyone was like, no, he's okay. He's out of the car. She was like, no, he was going to win it this year. <laughs> she didn't even care if he was hurt at all. She was just like, he was going to win. And then he now he's not. So I guess we're doing oh, this another God. year. I was about to say she cares a lot more about him than you and getting you back in the cart, but she just cared about him winning. She just wants to win. Honestly, like, uh, looking back on it, I genuinely appreciate her making me get back in the cart because I think I I have... dude. You're already a pussy. Yeah, mama didn't raise no bitch. Exactly, dude. I already have, like, a natural tendency to lean towards being a bitch, and I think that if I didn't, I would have been too scared to get back in the next week. At least she can look at you now and go, I tried. I tried, dude. Yeah, I mean, she did definitely didn't lack proud. effort. Yeah, I hope she's proud, dude. <laughs> Outcome maybe doesn't match effort, but Alec, what's your uh, what's your favorite karting event, either as a driver or as a worker? Uh, yeah, I mean, I guess it's cliche, but I mean, it probably have to be super nice, like we already talked about. I mean, just like we said, the atmosphere and everything, and just being in the city of Vegas downtown. Uh, and just all that goes on with, I mean, seeing those fields that big and everything and how much it means to everybody, but then everyone also getting unbelievably fucked up every night. It's just like, it's just all around just a badass event. I just like oh, yeah. pinpointing my favorite part of that event, and that's for sure X30 Senior LCQ. Oh, Best time. Not, not for the workers, dude. Oh, yeah. No, at that point. Yeah, you've got to be paying for you at this Marshall, point. This for Marshall's us. just looking everywhere. We're like, dude, I mean, we got to be watching this bubble spot. This guy thinks he's coming 40 at the first in the final. Like, he, yeah, dude. I mean, w- which, to be honest with you, like, I would be, like, if I was in that LCQ, like, it would be just important to me as, like, almost winning the damn thing to at least get into Sunday for at sure. that event. Because yeah. if I'm packing my shit Saturday night, dude, then I'm just like, this whole fucking weekend was a waste <laughs> of time, dude. <laughs> like, I, I would actually try to just be moving people left and right if I needed to get to, like, 10. This is exactly why Alex stopped racing, because then we have this conversation yeah. earlier where, like, you can't you can't justify your weekends based on the outcome all the time. Like, damn, that was a waste of money. Like, what do you mean? If you would have won, you spent the same amount of money. Like, yeah, you know, it can't just be a waste <laughs> now. It's just not how it works. <laughs> no, yeah, yeah, but I think like it's as Supernats goes, just the prestige level of it's For completely sure. different. So if I'm yeah. if I'm freaking driving my shit home Saturday and like not on Super Sunday, I'm like, dude, I can't even tell people I made the fucking race. Like, it's just so that's, not, not that's it. why. Alec and Christian in the past have decided to work. It's the only way they can guarantee their spot on, on Super Sunday. Sunday. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely, dude. I, mean, I sure Listen. as hell wouldn't be there in a cart. I'll tell you that. Oh, unless there's no man. LCQ. You heard it here, dude. Alec Coates, you know, professional marshal and stars race director, would fucking bone people in the LCQ to make the main. <laughs> yeah. So I guess that's fair game, dude. Have at it. Honestly, that's yeah, how I want to wrap this up. 
You know? Absolutely. That's Alec the Coates that's the takeaway. You for a spot on Super Sunday. That's great. Well, that's let's fair, fucking you know, let's name once that episode. Again, that. I'm, once again, I'm way too fat, so this will never actually happen. But <laughs> I can say it on here since this is uh, no limits on here. So yeah, I would I would move you for the fucking tenth spot in the LCQ. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Alec Coates, uh, obviously, I appreciate your friendship. Um, Absolutely, dude. And your time to come on this podcast and bullshit with us about go-karts. It's been a blast. Yeah, dude. It, it definitely took longer. I'm going to get lit up when I go to bed here, but it was totally worth it. So I so, appreciate you guys. Well, thank you guys for watching uh, this episode of Off the Grid, and we'll see you on track soon. Hold up. I shoot my shot. Wait, hold up. I'm really about to run this. Go up. You know what's up when it comes.